You know, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Good evening. So we're studying Hebrews, and we're at Hebrews 9, and I know that a Hebrews is a little heavy, but I gotta tell you, I'm excited to see uh, Hebrews 11, and, and if you don't remember what Hebrews 11, it's about faith, and about all the fathers that had the faith, and it's gonna be more, more or less the culmination of Hebrews. So just to remind you, if you weren't with us, Hebrews was written to people that were uh, Jews, uh, became Christian, and then they are in the process, either because of tribulation or what have you, they're, ta they're thinking of apostatizing and going back sh to Judaism. So through the book of Hebrews, basically St. Paul is telling them that, 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 uh, that, that Christ is, is, is the high priesthood of Christ is much superior than the high priesthood of Aaron, uh, and also that, he, that, that Christ is much superior than angels, because the Jews believed that the, the Old Testament was given to them through angels, uh, and, 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 and then also that Christ is superior than Moses, because to them Moses was really big. So this is where we're at, and now we're in chapter 9. Chapter 9 is a little long, but we're going to try to whisk through it, because I'll just tell you the, the summary, and it's more or less, he, he, St. Paul kind of you know, gave us heads up on it. The last couple of weeks, we're talking about the high priesthood of Christ. So... The three things that, that we're going to be talking about is that, the, that, that Christ, uh, his high priesthood is much superior than the high priesthood of Aaron. Uh, and, and also the sanctuary that Christ is in right now, it's a sanctuary not made by hands. Uh, it's in heaven versus the, whole, the tabernacle that was made by men. Uh, and the sacrifice that was given by Christ, by himself, is much superior than the blood of goats and, and animals that were, get, that were in the Old Testament. So in general, that's the idea. So with that, we'll kind of we'll go through it. So verse, chapter 9, verse 1, it says, that indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and the earthly sanctuary. So here he's telling them that in the Old, in the old Covenant, that first covenant, uh, because we, we, we were, he's comparing the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. New Covenant is the blood of Christ, through the blood of Christ. The Old Covenant is through the blood of animals and goats and promises, and we talked about that last week. So it says that even indeed the First Covenant had a lot of ordinances. In other words, there was a lot of, sprit, there was a lot of rituals that was involved. So it had a lot of ordinances of divine services in the earthly sanctuary. The reason he's emphasizing the earthly sanctuary, because he's going to compare the earthly sanctuary and the heavenly sanctuary, what Christ is right now seated on the right hand of the Father. So and then it goes on, it says, For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. So in other words, the way that the, the, the tabernacle was divided, it was in, there's an area outside of washing. People would wash before entering. And then once they entered, they enter a place called the sanctuary. These priests would be, were able to enter into the sanctuary regularly. And once you enter in the sanctuary, you'll find the lampstand on your right hand, the showbread, and so on. Priests entered regularly in there and to, to light the lamps, to change the showbread. And then, there, so that was called the holy sanctuary, the holy. But then there was a place called the holy of all. Sometimes people refer to it as the holy of holies. Uh, and in my Bible, it's the holiest of all. That area, no one was able to enter except the high priest once with the blood of animals. In other words, they were had, he had to have a sacrifice to enter. So keep that in mind. So verse 2, it says, For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part, which referred to the holies, in which was the lampstand, the table, and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And we call it, by the way, I refer to this as sanctuary a lot of times. And then, uh, and behind the second veil... So he considered that first door to the, to the sanctuary is the first veil, and then the one that it goes to the most holy or the holiest of all as the second veil. And he says, and behind the second veil, the part of the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all. What does it say here? Oh, it says the holiest of all too. It says the holiest of all. This is the Holy of Holies, sometimes people refer to it. So this is the inside part where the, where the, 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 the high priest enters once a year with, with the censer with the, and also with blood of animals. It says in verse 4, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid 
on all the side with gold in which were. So in other words, he's going to tell them what was inside the Holy of Holies. So if you remember when, when you were in Sunday school, what was in the Holy of Holies? There was basically, it was, there were three things and he's going to list them right now. It says the covenant overlaid on all sides uh, with, the gold, with gold in which were, the first thing was the golden pot that had the manna. Second thing was Aaron's rod that budded. And then the tablet of the covenant, which is the law, the Ten Commandments. So he's telling them these are the three things in the Holy of Holies. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. This is where we, where, where, where when we talk about atonement, it was the, the covering. It was the covering of uh, the two cherubs in, in front, on top of the, the mercy seat. So basically it was an Ark of a Covenant. It was like a box overlaid with gold. Inside of it were the three things, the golden pot, the manna, the Aaron's rod, and the tablets of the covenant. And on top of them were two big cherubs. And then under the cherubs was referred to as the mercy seat. Whenever God revealed himself and spoke to people uh, through Moses or whatever, it was from that mercy seat. That, that, that God was, was revealed, you know, he was, re he was talking to them from that mercy seat. And by the way, we call it also the judgment. Uh, so that's the mercy seat. It's, it's uh, because he's merciful. That's why we're referring it as mercy, mercy seat. And then it says, and above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things, we cannot speak in details. And then he goes on in verse 6, he says, Now when these things has been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services. So he's saying priests always entered in the first part. But into the second part of the high, into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself. In other words, he had to have blood with him. He had to have blood of a sacrifice with him in order for him to enter into the Holy of Holies. So he said he went alone once a year, not without blood, which, is, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. So there's this, something that's very important that I wanted to kind of focus on. When he said that the, the sins that people committed in ignorance. In the Old Testament, the sins that, that, that the people used to confess uh, and that were, were, you know, were, were temporarily uh, accepted as, as, as you know, just repenting and, and they, they used to uh, you know, sacrifice animals. It was the, the, the sins that people did out of ignorance, not knowing that they did that. It was sins that were, uh, it's called, it's a violation of the word of God, but without knowing it. So it's out of, it's out of ignorance they did these sins. These were the sins that were able, people were able to confess it, but the things, the things they did intentionally that was not, uh, that was not, you know, that was not, was able to be, for, you know, or, Repented, not repented on, but forgiven at that time. And even then it was not forgiveness at all, it was a signal. It was a sign of, of something big to come. But here he's saying that when the priest offered inside the Holy of Holies, it was for his sin and for the sins of the people that they committed in ignorance, not the intentional one. Because there is gonna be, there is gonna, it's going to make sense later. And then in verse 8 it says, the Holy Spirit indicating this, so the, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, indicated this, that the way into the holiest of, whole, of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. In other words, the ultimate sacrifice, it's, it's so long the, the, the tabernacle is existing, the, one, the, one, the, sin for, the, the forgiveness of sin for all is not existing yet because the plan of salvation has not happened yet. So in light, the Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. It, is, it did not, was not fulfilled yet. While the first tabernacle was still standing. And then he's going to emphasize that it, this was a symbol. This whole tabernacle that they had, it was all a symbol. In verse 9 it says, It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard of the conscience. In other words, the sacrifices that they offered in the Old Testament did, did, did made them temporarily feel okay, but it did not fix the conscience. It was not a complete forgiveness. It was just a sign for things to come. Verse 10 it says, 
concerned only with food and drinks, various washings, and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. So here he's saying, he's saying every day the things that were happening in the Old Testament, it was all concerned the external. It was about the food, the drinks, the, you know, the animal sacrifices, various purification of the outside. But it was all fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. So what is the Reformation? Until the time the true sacrifice is offered on the cross. So he's saying all these things in the past, in the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, it was all about external uh, cleansing and fleshy ordinances and so on until the full reformation where when the, when the ultimate sacrifice that is sacrificed on the cross once in for all and then he goes on and he, now he starts talking about the the the, the true sacrifices then the christ uh, christ christ as our high priest verse 11 it says but christ and now he's comparing the aaron uh, priesthood and, and and now he's talking about he's going to talk about the christ high priesthood Verse 11, it says, But Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come. That's for the salvation. And then he goes on, it says, With the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is not of this creation. So he's telling them that when Christ came and fulfilled that sacrifice on the cross and the atonement and the redemption of humankind, now he is in a tabernacle, in a sanctuary that is not made by man. And we read that in last chapter. So that it is not created like the, 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 the tabernacle that they had. Verse 12, it says, Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all. So here he's telling them clearly that in the past, priests would enter once a year with blood of animals for, for the priest's sin and for the ignorances of the people. But Christ is different. He entered into the, the most holy place and he doesn't enter it once a year, but he entered one sin for all because the sacrifice is an unlimited sacrifice and Christ is, is, is God, he's unlimited. So it's one sin for all, having obtained not a temporary, like what they used to do with the, uh, with the animals or signs, but this is an eternal redemption. So let's l look a little bit about the, wor the word redemption. Uh, redemption is reserved to when there is a slave that uh, is, is freed in a way, and he's able to pay for whatever in order for him to be free. Whatever that, uh, when he is freed, that is called redemption. It's the freedom of a slave. And this is what he is referring to here, where Christ redeemed. In other words, we were enslaved because of our, the price of our sin, and, and, and our ultimate destination is death. But because of his redemption, he freed us as slaves from the sin. Verse 13, it says, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies uh, for the purification of the flesh how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God cleanse your conscience which was temporary from dread works to, to serve the living God so let me just talk to you a little bit about the heifer it says the ashes of the heifer and he's talking here about and, and remember he was talking about the cleanness from the outside what happened was in the Old Testament if a man touches a dead man that person is unclean. And how do you get him become uh, declared clean? Uh, the priest would declare him clean again. Is They would bring a, a heifer. It's called the sacrifice of the red heifer. And, and you, see, you read about that in Numbers 19. So what they would do is they bring a heifer. It's like it's an animal. And they would slaughter that animal outside the camp. And then they would bring uh, all the, 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 the body, uh, the, the carcass and the blood. And they would burn it outside the camp. And then they would take the ashes of that red heifer, mix it with water, and sprinkle it on that person that is unclean. And now, he, then after that, the priest considers him clean. So here he's telling them that all these rituals that they did, it says, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the, asher of, and the ashes of the heifer, sprinkling the unclean sacrifices for the purifying of the flesh, so that it's all external, computer, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, 
Cleanse are your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. In other words, here he's saying that in the old, it was, uh, you know, the sacrifices of animal enabled you to get temporary sign or comforting in your conscience, but it was not complete comforting in your conscience uh, from the sins that you've done in ignorance. And here he's saying, now this is going to cleanse your conscience from the dead works, from the sins. In other words, from the sins that you intentionally did. And this is the difference, one of the difference between the sacrifices in the Old Testament is that Christ is enabled, the, the sacrifice on the cross forgives the sins that we commit intentionally. While before, it was only things that were, you know, symbol of things that were done intentional. So here he's saying how much more uh, that sacrifice is to us. It's an eternal, you know, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Verse 15, he goes on and he says, and for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death. In other words, one of the things that, that when somebody, when there was a covenant made, the, the way, just, just to kind of clarify what would happen in the, in the old covenant, is that when there's a covenant between people, they would bring an animal, cut the animal in half, put one half on one side, put the other on the other side, and then they leave the blood in the middle, and those who have, are making the covenant would walk through that blood. That's the blood path. In other words, if any, if any of these two break that covenant, one of them would have to shed blood. But in the, in the Old Testament, when, when that happened, only God that walked through, not with, not with Moses. So here he's talking about that covenant. He's saying, and for this reason, now he, Jesus, God, is the one that's paying because he's the one that walked through the blood path for us in, 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 in the time of in, in, in the covenant when he made with Moses. And, and here that's why he is the mediator. He paid for the price for us. And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death. Because somebody breaks the covenant, they would have to die. For the redemption of the transgression under the first covenant, which the one that would happen in the, in the, Old, in the Old Testament. That those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. In other words, here he's talking that when they died, when like Abraham, Isaac, Moses, all these people died, they died on a promise. It was not an eternal forgiveness. It was a promise that they will be forgiven one day. Verse 16, it says, For where there is a testament, there must also be, must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. lives. Therefore, not even the first covenant has dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats with water, scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both on the book, which is the covenant or the, 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 ark, uh, the ark of the covenant and, and the law, the, both the book itself and all the people saying, this is the blood of the covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. So he, basically what he's trying to tell him here is that things are purified with blood. There's got to be a bloodshed for sins. Uh, there's there's got to be an offering of a blood. So that's what they did. That's he's, he's, he's explaining what Moses did in the Old Testament. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no remission. So here he's basically telling them that now Christ, through shedding his blood, he enabled us now to go into the holiest of all. While before, only the high priest is able to go in once a year. Verse 23, he's repeating the same, more or less the same stuff that he mentioned. He's repeating and he's going to emphasize on it a little bit. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies, in other words, the stuff that were on the Old Testament, the Ark of the Covenant, the Tabernacle, these are all copies of, of the things to come, which, is, which was a copy of the heavenly sanctuary. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. It's comparing the heavenly and the earthly. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands. He's repeating it again. That, that, that what Christ abodes right now is basically it's not a place that is made by hands. Which are copies of the true. But into heaven itself. 
uh, now to appear in the presence of God for as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. So he's saying that in the Old Testament, a high priest entered with the blood of an animal. And then in verse 26, he says, He, mean Christ, then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world, but now once at the end of the ages. So at the fullness of time, Christ suffered once and was crucified once for mankind. And then he goes on, it says, He has appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. In other words, he was the high priest, as St. Cyril teaches us. He is the high priest and the sacrifice. And then verse 27, And as it is appointed for men to once die, to die once, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sin of many. So in other words, it's not, and by the way, it's very interesting, it doesn't say all. Because he doesn't bear the sins of all. He bears the sins of those who accept the sacrifice. It says that, but after this, the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, of those who accept, to those who eagerly wait for him. He will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. So in other words, the first time that when Christ appeared and he came, it was because of our sins and to, to redeem us, to free us as slaves. But then the second time, it's not going to be for sin, but it's actually going to be for salvation. The, the, that's going to be the judgment day. Uh, I know it's a tough chapter, and I know we whisk through it. And, and, but, I, but I want to kind of, we're holding on, and, and, and I'm thinking we might whisk through chapter 10, but we'll, talk, we'll, we'll focus on chapter 11 next time, because that's the chapter of faith. Uh, so I, I encourage you in light of what we, we, you know, the little explanations that we go through, that you read it, and it kind of gives you a little perspective. Anyone have any questions? Let's pray. Make us worthy, O Lord, to pray. Thanks to our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from the evil one. Through Christ Jesus our Lord. Thine is the kingdom, power, and glory forever. Now the love of God the Father, the grace of His only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ, the communion and gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The peace of the Lord be with you.